Today down in the comments, I want to hear uh, from the uh, collectors in the audience. I want to hear if the idea of a steel book, a steel book, DVD, or Blu-ray holds any kind of special appeal for you, because we're going to talk about that, among other things, today. Hello, I'm Adam Caesar. I am the author of Clown in a Cornfield and several other books that you can go buy uh, in hardcover, paperback, uh, ebook, and audiobook. If you like listening to books, you can go get those right now and you can review them. You can tell all your friends about them. I'm Adam Caesar, and this is Project Black T shirt, the YouTube channel where I take uh, a horror movie or multiple horror movies and then pair them with a piece of horror fiction you will enjoy reading if you like those movies. Be sure to like, subscribe, and go check out the other videos on my channel if you like what you're seeing here. Uh, and even if you don't like it, some of them are even probably even better than this. Today we're going to talk about three basically uh, unrelated films, but the, the uniting factor is that they were all released from Scream Factory, which is the subsidiary of Shout Factory that uh, releases reissue horror movies on Blu-ray. They're really the biggest game in town. They're really the big uh, label. Uh, I, I talk about Vinegar Syndrome on the channel a lot. I talk about uh, Arrow video on the channel a lot. I talk about VCI. I talk about Garage House. I talk about all these different film labels, uh, Blu-ray labels, but the really the, the, the big boy in the pool is Scream Factory. And I don't talk about their movies as much as those other ones, and it's partly because they are the big boy in the pool and they do release the bigger titles and they are, that's, that's what everyone kind of, that's what dominates the conversation in horror fandom. Those movies and those titles probably don't really need me talking about them. Uh, although, like, as you can tell from my shelves, I do get a lot of these releases and I do enjoy a lot of these releases, I just don't talk about them as much. Today we're going to talk about three separate films and the reason that I'm pairing them uh, all together is that I watched them somewhat recently because they all came in a box together. When I get stuff from Scream Factory, I usually time what I want, getting what I want around sales because they do uh, a huge kind of direct sales business and they, the, the best time to buy their movies is when they're having one or more different items on sale and then you can combine them for free shipping and that's what I did. Uh, recently they had a steelbook sale, hence the question at the top of the video, they had a, uh, a steelbook sale and all their steelbooks which are usually like these luxe, exorbitantly priced editions that I probably wouldn't uh, touch, uh, they were on sale and uh, very specifically, this bad boy was on sale. They've started reissuing a lot of the Roger Corman produced films that they did Blu-ray releases of previously. This is years ago when the label was kind of in its infancy when they were doing these uh, Corman cult classics lines um, on DVD and Blu-ray. They've started reissuing them as these really pretty uh, steel books. And I say really pretty where I'm not usually like a sucker for packaging. I, I own very few steelbooks because they are expensive and I, because I'm not a collector on that level where I really like need, want, have to have them. Um, but I've kind of accumulated a few and the bulk of them so far are these Screen Factory Roger Corman reissues. Because so far all of them have been new scans of the film, 4K scans of the film, even though these aren't 4K HD uh, Blu-rays, they are just uh, standard Blu-rays, but they have new uh, transfers of the film, and some of them have new special features. Um, and if you can see that right above me, I have a, a signed Piranha press kit up there, signed by director Joe Dante and uh, star Dick Miller. I'm a bit of a Roger Corman fan. He's really kind of uh, one of the few people in the film industry I would like you know, you don't want to put anyone you don't really know on a pedestal because it's like you just enjoy their work. But I see him as like this kind of mythic heroic figure in a certain way in the way he approached the film business and making films. Uh, and I, I find him endlessly fascinating. So I've, I've read a ton of, I've read his bi autobiographies, I've read uh, biographies of him, I've seen documentaries of him. Corman's World is a pretty good one that I think Shout Ch Factory themselves even put out. Uh, I, I've read books strictly on his New World Pictures venture. He is a fascinating figure to me. And if I were going to kind of collect one thing in these steel books, uh, I figured it would be the work of Roger Corman. I don't really know much in the way of like what fans think of Piranha, of 1978's Piranha, which is uh, very clearly a Jaws uh, riff, a Jaws ripoff. 
but it is done with such uh, care and nuance and uh, Corman energy in that he gave Joe Dante right after uh, co-directing with Alan Arkish, he, he they co-directed a movie called Hollywood Boulevard, which if you're if you're familiar with it is almost like a uh, a clip show movie because they were they were Alan Arkish and, and and Joe Dante were were two of Corman's most prolific trailer editors. They were they were cutting trailers for all these movies as as they were coming in and they were making these really well-performing trailers for Corman. Uh, he kind of started them out with Hollywood Boulevard, which is which reconstitutes a lot of uh, footage from other Corman pictures. Uh, kind of the bigger the bigger special effects and stuff like that are all uh, reused. Uh, and then they, they, they weave this little um, kind of uh, raunchy comedy around those sequences. Uh, Hollywood Boulevard's really great. I really like it. Uh, I think Code Red put it out. No, it's not Code Red. It's... Scorpion releasing put it out. I really like Hollywood Boulevard, uh, but I think the first the first real Joe Dante movie, the first solo Joe Dante movie is Piranha. And I have such a special affinity for this film. Uh, ever since kind of the, the, the days of VHS rental, I really, really enjoyed this film. Time period, it has a kind of almost melting pot aspect to it where it feels like, uh, it feels like, a, like a rural adventure movie. It's got even like, it's got even car chases in it. It's got like a kind of Smokey and the Bandit kind of car chase in it. Uh, it feels like it's got a camp in it, so it feels like, kind of like it's got like a meatballs type um, vibe to it. It's got when animals attack. It's got um, cool stop motion animation critters in, in one sequence. So it, so it has like it's not just an when animals attack. It's also uh, government uh, conspiracy and government uh, experiment kind of horror. The setting's really great. Uh, it's got a lot of kind of you'd call it stunt casting now but it's just got a lot of familiar faces that pop up barbara Steele plays a quick role dick miller kevin mccarthy from the invasion of body snatchers paul bartell who 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 was in hollywood boulevard and would continue being in these the corman pictures it's got that kind of almost hangout movie vibe to it where i've seen it so many times now and i've and i've enjoyed it so many times and enjoyed it in so many different parts of my life like as a child as a high schooler as you know a, a, a movie guy in like in college and beyond there was recently a twitter meme that was like name your comfort horror movies or name your comfort movies and piranha is really 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 one of those pictures for me it's also not really urbane to this to this release but it's also a, a film franchise that i think is incredibly underrated because i think piranha 2 the spawning i think i might have even talked about that on the uh, on the channel before i really really uh like piranha 2 uh, I think it is uh, incredibly underrated, even though it doesn't have that Corman-ness to it. it. It replaces it with like wacky Italian-ness and James Cameron-ness. Uh, and then the uh, the remake, the Alexandria Aja uh, remake, which is quasi-remake, quasi-reboot, quasi not really related to the original film. Um, but I, I I love that movie. It's a, it's a great theatrical experience. I really enjoy that film. Uh, the only one I'm not I'm not super crazy about is the is the fourth one, um, the um, the John Gulliger one. Uh, just because it feels a little too mean and cynical uh, and overly jokey to me, um, but you can't win them all. I, I like this. I like this film series. Uh, this ports over all the other special features that were on the Corman Classics discs. Uh, but the reason I was I was even intrigued and wanted to pull the trigger, and I'm not a double dipper. I don't do that a lot. Um, I'll probably run a giveaway for the the last disc on my Twitter or something like that. But the reason I wanted this is it has a, it, it's not only the new transfer, which looks gorgeous. The movie looks brand new. The greens really pop. It's got a, it's, it's, a, it's a lush kind of woodsy movie, and I really love that aspect of it. The only new feature on here is a newly recorded, um, they call it a commentary, but it's really just an audio interview uh, with uh, Corman. It's Justin Beam, uh, who does a lot of the uh, Shout Factory special features, having a really long, uh, in-depth conversation uh, with uh, Roger Corman. This, it was recorded, it must have been recorded right around um, uh, Dick Miller's death, so they kind of open with that. They, they talk about the, his relationship with Dick Miller, his working relationship, and then it goes back um, and, and becomes almost like, an, uh, like a 90-minute biography of Corman where he talks about um, his father being an engineer, all this different stuff, uh, and it's, it, it's almost like, uh, almost barely a commentary, almost barely about Piranha itself, but mostly about Corman and his career. It's a really nice commentary, uh, a wonderful testament to uh, Corman's career and the beginning of Joe Dante's career. Uh, if you've never seen Piranha, I highly, highly, highly recommend picking it up. It's great. The next movie that came in that box that I wanted to talk about that I uh, just uh, recently rewatched, these are all actually rewatches. It doesn't typically happen a whole lot because I don't re compulsively rewatch things. 
Um, I, I generally rewatch things when enough distance has, has, has come from their release and I don't remember them anymore. Uh, that's, that's the case of The Hills Run Red. Uh, this is a film by Dave Parker, who also who's kind of uh, cut his bones in uh, full moon features and had co-directed and directed uh, a bunch of full moon movies, including The Dead Hate the Living. Um, I think he even started, kind of like uh, Joe Dante, I think he even started uh, cutting trailers and special features uh, and video zones for Charlie Band. So there's, oh, there's that connection. That's, that's the, that's the, the Dave Parker is the, is the Joe Dante of Full Moon. But this was a movie that was released straight to video. You may, you may remember this, this cover, which is very clearly, at least the font is meant to evoke the Hills Have Eyes remake, even though the movie's nothing like that. Uh, it was just kind of a marketing gimmick. Uh, and you may remember this cover, but it, it was 2009, it says on the back. And that, that tracks, uh, I kind of remember this from either, I guess, uh, sometime in college, uh, or or maybe right before college. I don't know. I, I don't know how old I am, what year anything was. It's a blur. But I remember I, I got this film when it came out, when it came out on DVD, went straight to video. Um, a very interesting era, a very interesting epoch in uh, horror movies, because there were a lot of these straight to video movies, and some of them were... Some of them were like Anchor Bay and uh, Dark Sky and the, and, and, and the kind of lower budgeted companies, that the big mega corporation companies. Uh, but The Hills Run Red is interesting because it's, it's one of the grossest, darkest, meanest ones. And uh, it's actually Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers made this movie. Warner Brothers put up the money for this movie. Uh, Warner Brothers along with Dark Castle Entertainment. This was, the, this was a, a short lived Dark Castle home entertainment attempt. Uh, Warner Premiere was the, the label that put this out. They were the straight-to-video arm of uh, Warner. And it didn't begin life that way, but it, it became that. Uh, I remember liking it. I remember kind of enjoying it and not not thinking uh, overly much about it, just being like kind of surprised when the, when it, whenever I watched it, I, I think like maybe freshman year of college, I just remember being like, wow, this is, this is a, a well-made, expensive-looking movie for a straight to video straight to dvd movie because around the time there really were good movies coming out uh straight to dvd and you you never really knew it wasn't quite like you know the the decades before it wasn't quite like the straight to video movies where you could get completely screwed uh picking something up and having it be terrible and ter and, and, and and cheap and bad uh because there was so much stuff coming out kind of straight to video straight to vhs uh but like at, at this moment uh, companies were getting a little bit more savvy, realizing that they needed to put a little bit more money into these uh, productions and, and, and realizing that they need to be kind of quality films. Uh, and that's what Hills, Hills Run Red was. It's, it, you watch it now, um, 11 years later, I guess, more, uh, and you're just surprised. Like, this would be kind of a theatrical release now. This would be kind of one of those um, premier VOD movies that everyone's talking about because we're so starved for entertainment and when something hits either Netflix or Vudu, um, kind of first weekend or the, you know the drive-in movie theaters right now we all talk about it and it all becomes kind of the, the movie conversation of the moment but I guess maybe just I was out of the conversation maybe that happened when this movie came out but um, I didn't have much of a conversation I just kind of saw it remember getting the DVD liking it and then just kind of moving on this blu-ray is a really great chance to reappraise this movie and it and and uh, I don't know hundred percent what it was I don't know if it's, if it's the prominent feature and, and, and kind of scenery scenery chewing performance of uh, William Sadler right after watching Bill and Ted face the music uh, this this week uh, but something about the Hills Run Red really struck me this second time um, this blu-ray it, it, it looks gorgeous it like the movie looks even like better than I remember it it's just as mean as I remember but not quite as um, downbeat and cynical as I kind of thought it was. I remember it just being super gross and me kind of a little bit recoiling at that because uh, it felt a little tryhard. That that didn't um, that actually didn't happen this time. And I and I, and I there's um, there's some nice character work and there's just a lot of it ladles so many ideas and it's like it's like an hour and twenty minutes. And when you look at the special features and you listen to director Dave Parker and uh, the writer David J. Scow uh, talk about it. Uh, you know why it's only an hour and 21 minutes because it was kind of really cut down and they cut a lot of the uh, WB kind of took a lot of the, the, the more extreme stuff out of here. But you watch the film now, or at least I watch the film now, and you hear Parker kind of be ambivalent about those cuts and, and, and what was left out of the film. 
But I watch the movie now and I really do wonder, like, maybe this is, maybe this is like the version I would prefer. Uh, it's it, it's the movies just mean enough. Um, I think any more and it might be too mean. And it and it and it moves. He 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 kind of in these retrospective features, he kind of talks about how he feels the pacing's a little uh, wonky, or uh, he seems like his he seems like. Uh, his own worst critic on these um, on these special features, which in in some ways you want an artist to, to be that. Um, but I was very much surprised by this movie. I was very much surprised on the rewatch how much I really like took a shine to it. How much I really really enjoyed this film. I'm sure I have I've talked about the movie enough, um, and mo a lot of people um, when I talk about movies, the first thing they ask me, "What's it about?" Uh, I never think about films that way. So you're probably screaming at uh, YouTube being like, why don't you just tell us a synopsis? So this is, this is about a, a, a film fan who wants to find a legendary film called The Hills Run Red that only ran for, there were only a couple showings of the movie at drive-ins and stuff like that. Um, and then it disappeared from the face of the earth. And all that's left of this movie is the trailer, 1980s slasher movie. And all that's left is the trailer and kind of like a few snippets of this this slasher killer of the movie Babyface, um, and what the what the film fan convinces his girlfriend and his roommate to do is to track down the the daughter of the director who the director supposedly dead, and he tracks down the daughter of the director and, and convinces her to bring them to the original shooting locations of the movie. It's really convoluted. It's 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 it, there's. There is there is like a season and a half of television plot in the eighty minutes of the Hills Run Red, and that's that's a feature, not a bug. Uh, I I think it's there's a lot going on. Just when you start to think this doesn't make any sense, the movie will introduce a twist that does put a certain kind of logic, or at least an internal logic, on the sequences that you've already seen, and 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 you're you're into it. Uh, at least I am. I was like leaning forward because uh, I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten everything that happened in the last thirty minutes of this movie. I know it's only been eleven years, but geez, what what an eleven years they must have been because I couldn't remember a damn thing from the ending of this movie. It was delightful. I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. If you're a fan of this film, or if you or if you feel like this is something you'd like, this disc is like if you if you look at the list of features, all the new, 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 new. There's um. I guess it was pretty bare bones when Warner originally put this uh, DVD out, especially since they kind of didn't treat uh, Parker uh, overly well, it doesn't sound like. Uh, but the, the Scream Factory's kind of given him a second at bat to do all these uh, special features. I don't, I've only watched like, I've watched like an hour of them, but there's a lot, lot more uh, discussion of this movie on here. There's like, there's like, what are there? There's like two commentary tracks or three commentary tracks. It's ridiculous. Yeah, if you if you're a fan of this film, uh, you are you are in for an absolute treat. This is a uh, must get disc if you um, if you have any kind of special warm feelings for this movie. It is, is clearly the definitive edition. Um, and if you haven't uh, seen it, if it, if it kind of eluded you, kind of don't judge a book by its cover because I this is the, this was this was marketed as a Hills Have Eyes ripoff, and then it was it was even self marketed by Parker and others involved with it as like as like a slasher uh, like a like a throwback slasher which is it's neither of those things it's really not it's 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 more of a um it's more of like a weird uh meta but not too meta not overly referential discussion of film fandom and like creativity and uh the idea of being a completionist and an aficionado and how far you'll go to seek out the movies that we talk about on this channel and the movies that we enjoy, and it's, it is, you know, there's there's moments that clunk. There's 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 uh, dialogue and performances that I I, I wasn't a hundred percent vibing with all the time. But the the overall ideas of the movie are much smarter than the kind of first blush. Uh, I really enjoy it, and I really uh, encourage you to check it out if you haven't. And the last film we're going to talk about, uh, boy. Uh, this is a trip down memory lane and it's one of those things where 1999 at least to me doesn't seem like that long ago but you revisit films from that era and um, you're like wow stylistically just tone wise just like this had such a distinct um, effect and such a distinct look uh, and such a distinct feeling these late 90s early 2000s films and this was kind of the movie that set that uh, bar and set that style in a certain way. This is the remake of House on Haunted Hill, the uh, William Castle film. First release from uh, in, con uh, in, in conjunction with WB 
and uh, Castle Terry Castle, uh, Castle's uh, progeny, and they were like, okay, we're going to do a whole label that's that's new films and remakes of William Castle classics. And the other remake they did was uh, 13 Ghosts. Uh, and this is really, this was the first and to my memory, I have it's been a while since I've seen many of them. I haven't seen Fear.com in a minute. I haven't seen 13 Ghosts in a minute. Although after this, I probably will get the Scream Factory disc of uh, 13 Ghosts. I haven't seen the House of Wax uh, remake in a minute, which wasn't a William Castle film, but was a Dark Castle film. And I really, I, I remember really liking that movie. But um, this is the, this for my money was the best one. And it holds up uh, on rewatch. This is House on Haunted Hill. Um, Jeffrey Rush is playing a um, styled after uh, the Vincent Price character in the original, not just in character, but in, in content, in like look. He has like his little stick on uh, pencil thin mustache. He's uh, chewing scenery here. He seems like he's having uh, the best time an Oscar winner's ever had in a, like a paycheck picture. Um, Tay Diggs, Femke Jensen, uh, never never once been able to say her name right. Peter Gallagher and uh, SNL's own Chris Kattan, actually in a somewhat nuanced, restrained role. This is, this is uh, you know, the plot of House on Haunted Hill. It's people uh, are invited to a party by a kind of rich, notorious trickster who hates his wife, and they're, uh, they're there, and he says, you're gonna win a million dollars if you can stay the night for the, for the party. He makes the mistake of holding it in an actual haunted house, only in this version, it's not a house. It is an old, abandoned, insane asylum. Uh, it doesn't look like a house at all, so it's, it, is, it is a stretch when characters keep saying, oh, we're in this house, and it's like, this isn't a house. Why do you keep calling this a house? This is directed by William Malone. This is uh, set directed and, um, and, and production designed to the absolute nines. It, it features Jeffrey Combs in a really small but really significant role. He's like one of the main ghosts. He's like the kind of creepy doctor who was, you know, experimenting on all the um, uh, mental patients back when this was an asylum and then, then it burned down and then that's why are there all these ghosts around. Uh, but it's just such a good mix of, of scares and laughs and uh, really, really, really uh, inventive uh, gore and uh, character design is like, this is like, when people think of the 90s, they, they always, they always do that like, oh, it was, you know, the years of the PG-13 and, and maybe that was true in the, the mid 90s, uh, but this is not a teen thriller. This is a full-blooded uh, R-rated horror movie where, um, you know, it's K&B effects, it's, it's, it's Robert Kurtzman, it's Howard Berger, it's, um, who's the end, Greg Nicotero. It's, it's them together, like really at the top of their game. The, the creature designs, because they're, they're kind of creaturey ghosts, are incredible. The, um, the gore effects are great. The uh, early, early optical uh, uh, and CGI effects are very minimal and very, um, they hold up. They, they, they look better than I even remember them looking in the theater because I, I do remember that kind of third act not being 100% in love with the look of the, the, the ghost and the big design of the darkness. Um, but it, watching it on Blu-ray, you realize how, how kind of interesting the look of it was. I like Ali Larder. I like Tay Diggs. They're really likable protagonists and, and like really proactive protagonists. Uh, the, just and the real just star is just the design and the look of this movie. So they have like an hour long interview with Malone here, who's it's not really a making of. It's just an interview with him, but he goes through kind of every aspect of making the movie, and you realize just how much inventiveness and how much how much how much they were looking to stretch a dollar. Like they, this is a bigger Hollywood movie, but they realized their limitations and they realized um, how much they wanted to put on the screen. They really do. Um, you know, twenty something year old movie. And I can't, it's hard to find fault with it. I really, really enjoyed it. And I don't think that's just, I don't think that's purely nostalgia because I remember liking this movie in the theater. I remember going to see it and really being scared by it and really thinking it was like kind of a next step for me as a, as a young film goer for as long, as far as like gore and extremity and what I could kind of take in a movie theater. Uh, so I do remember it fondly, uh, but I didn't, for the last 15 years, I haven't been thinking like, oh yeah, no, it's really good. Uh, the House on Haunted Hill remake. Um, but revisiting this Blu-ray, and it looks spectacular, and kudos to Screen Factory for doing this, um, but it, it really made me realize that what a turning point it was and what a what an interesting kind of underrated little um, period in, in, in horror film, and at least in Hollywood horror film, that, that it ushered in. It's a shame that, uh, that I don't have as fond of memories as the other movies, because I'm going to go back, I think, and watch them now uh, and see if that changed, see if my opinion of them changed, but it, it's... it's really really enjoyable film I, I highly recommend it. if you haven't seen it since it came out or if you haven't seen it since like that uh you know that old uh the paper 
cardboard DVD that opened on the side. I, I recommend checking it out. It's really good. For this week's book recommendation, just came out yesterday. I just started reading it uh, last night. He's the man, the myth, the legend. We talk about him on this channel all the time. We've talked about him more than any other, any other author we probably recommended on this channel. But Stephen Graham Jones's new novella, Night of the Mannequins, uh, just came out. Quick read. I'm like, I'm already most of the way through it so I can talk to you about how good it is. Um, but it, I, it's one of those things where he's becoming one of those authors where uh, I would be absolutely shocked if I were if I were underwhelmed by anything he, he puts out. And the fact that this came out, what, like it was like, what, four months ago, less than that, that uh, that Only Good Indians came out, his, his, his latest novel. The fact that you could have that amount of quality in, in, in that span of time is is insane to me um uh this is a this is a um this is a kind of slasher uh it begins with a with a prank gone ho horribly wrong uh, with teenagers at a movie theater uh involving a mannequin that they've kind of that they've kind of adopted as their like uh, teen group mascot because they like they found it and they, they they disassemble it and they bring it all over it's uh it's surprising and it's funny and it's weird and it's very Jonesian in its construction it has one of the best first sentences I've ever read uh it's it's it, high, you know highest recommendation especially uh, especially if you've read Only Good Indians uh, but if you haven't read that one yet it's like still recent enough that it can be also another book recommendation uh that's my favorite book of the year it's awesome it's so good uh check them check them out check both of these out and and, and Night of the Mannequins really fits with the, the type of movies we were talking about here it's a it's a, it's a kind of on brand on theme recommendation you'll you'll see when i when you read it because it does have that kind of feeling of it's talking about movies it's, it's it's movie theater it's 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 teenagers it's 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 very very much of a piece with these movies we're talking about also i'm sur sure you're tired of me uh talking about it but i'm not i'm, I'm not uh thank you so much to everyone who has bought uh clown in the cornfield uh look at that Ooh, beautiful uh, these, these beautiful blurbs on the back too. It's, it's incredible. Uh, this, the hardcover uh, looks so good. And uh, from what I can tell, from what limited knowledge I have and Harper has given me, it's selling well. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, people have been Instagramming and reviewing it on Goodreads and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and going into their Barnes and Nobles and taking pictures of it on the shelves and sending them to me. Um, it is, it is an, uh, one of the great highlights of my life. Uh, this last week. So thank you so much to everyone who's picked it up. Everyone who's picked up the audiobook uh, narrated by Jesse Valinsky. It's really good. Um, enjoy it. When you're done with it, make sure to um, rate it. The Audible app like comes up and asks you to rate it. Just just, just rate it, please. It helps us out so much. It helps me and the narrator, Jesse Valinsky, out. Um, the ebook, the just, it's, it's and this just gorgeous hardcover. It, I'm so proud of this book. Uh, I'm so um, proud that in, in a in a world awash with killer clowns, um, Friendo the Clown and his Midwestern murder is um, is resonating with people, and it's just it's just a real joy. So thank you so much to everyone who's picked one up, uh, or is going to pick one up, or has told their friends to pick one up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I uh, can't thank you enough. That is it. That's this week. Uh, like, subscribe, follow me, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. If, if you want to uh, get in touch, I will be down in the comments as I always am. And uh, links to everything we talked about are down in the comments, too, if you want to go pick those up. Uh, but, yeah, I'm Adam Caesar, and I'll see you next week.